My name is Scott Kozak, and I'm the Associate Director of Marketing and Communications at Colorado State University Global Campus. Thank you for joining us. I'm excited to introduce the first panel of the day. Please join me in welcoming your moderator, Aaron Gorin. Aaron is currently President of Digital Media and EVP of Strategy at USIM, the fastest growing independent media agency, where he's responsible for leading integrated strategy, innovation, and digital operations. He combines experience and leadership in marketing and analytics with a deep understanding of how technology is changing the way businesses acquire, retain, and service customers. Aaron is also a founding partner at Inside Ventures LLC, an early stage business incubator. Now, I turn things over to Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the panel uh, this morning. Uh, the first in the panel is Carolyn Schaub. She is the CEO of Aurora Sisters Cities International, a nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering global partnerships, trade, and cultural and educational exchanges on behalf of the city of Aurora, Colorado. She previously directed two academic programs at the University of Denver Stern College of Law and is a practitioner of law manager legal clinic dedicated to representing immigrant victims of violent crime with humanitarian and other visa applications. Next is Dr. Kurt Miller. Dr. Miller is a program manager at the Saudi Electronics University responsible for all managerial and operational requirements for delivery of the MBA, Edmonton Information Security, and Master's in Health Administration, and, and, and Management Degree Program. Dr. Miller has over 41 years of management experience, including 25 years of HR experience. He's also a retired professor and Marine Corps officer, having served in active duty from 1973 to 1994. The third panelist is Charlie Nguyen. He is the founder and CEO of TMS Global, which provides global access to quality education for everyone. He is core companies are online operations, global partnerships, and general management. Fire experience at University of Phoenix, uh, helping them grow to that over half a million students. And the final uh, panelist is Haya al Kani. Uh, I recently received her MBA from Saudi Electronics University in May of 2017. She's an accomplished and former student professional who has spent over a decade working in corporate banking. With that, I'm going to start with some questions to our panelists. Please describe your criteria for effective partnership models and give an example of a partnership that has worked. Uh, Carlin Shorb, I'm the CEO of Aurora Sister Cities International. And we're a small nonprofit organization um, dedicated to promoting uh, international trade and cultural and educational exchange. Um, criteria for effective partnership models, um, I kind of wrote a list here of a couple of things that, or a few things that I think are very, very important. Um, the first one is to see if a partnership is mutually beneficial. Um, you certainly don't want to enter into a partnership with another organization unless you can both benefit from the partnership. Um, also shared goals. Uh, so uh, usually some common shared goals uh, in entering into the partnership are, are key. And then I would say some over either some shared mission, vision, or values, or at least some overlap in your share, um, mission, vision, and values. Um, and then sort of on a more practical level, um, I'd written some notes to myself about uh, making sure that when you're entering into the partnership, you kind of have an equal or level playing field um, so that um, both partners are treated as equals or it's, and it's, that it's also very, very clear or that you set clear uh, and concise roles and responsibilities for the partnership, um, and that those are set up front. <laughs> um, and then also mutual respect for the partnership is very, very important. So, and um, an ex example of an effective partnership, um, so I'll go back to the days when I was uh, actually practicing law, a very effective partnership that we had, um, I used to run a, a small nonprofit legal clinic, and we actually had a partnered um, with three different organizations on a, um, a grant. Um, and we received a very, very large grant, but we had to, in order to receive the grant and the funding, um, we uh, had to partner with other organizations. Um, and so there was a group of four uh, organizations that partnered to receive the grant. And because um, of an, the effective partnership and that clear roles and responsibilities were set to begin with, um, we were actually able to receive that grant funding, which other organizations perhaps might not have been able to because they didn't um, have such a clear partnership. Um, what was really important to the success of that partnership was actually that we all set, we all had a distinct role in, in the grant piece. Um, and so, for example, my clinic, we provided the immigration support. The other organization pro provided family um, legal services. Another organization did protection order hearings. And another organization um, provided social services, um, kind of the wraparound social services. So. Um, so I'd say that was a really good example uh, of an effective partnership. And I think the reason that it worked so well, again, is that we set um, our criteria uh, 
very, very clearly up front. Um, and you know, we had a, a clear agreement and we each shared or were each lacking in some piece where we could benefit from each other uh, in a mutual way that kind of um, helped that partnership uh, be successful. I think that's a great example of a true partnership where everybody brings their best strengths uh, I think a lot of times people tend to look at, uh, can I do it on my own, where these partnerships really uh, with the best of everybody's experiences. Uh, with that, let me uh, hand it to uh, Dr. Miller. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. I just want to add a few. Uh, an open and an honest communication is very important between the partners. Um, the partners must be equal. Um, there must be an understanding and a definition of the roles of each partner. Uh, it must be financially viable for each partner when, when, you're, in, uh, when you're in a relationship uh, where there is um, a tuition um, sharing. And there must be support of higher level academic ri excellence, rigor, and integrity. That's important that you do not reduce your standards. As far as an example of, a, um, of an excellent partnership, um, uh, currently um, CSU Global, and Saudi Electronic University is um, in their sixth year of a strategic partnership. Um, initially, we started with the MBA program. Um, shortly thereafter, um, uh, we initiated a uh, MS in information security, which is uh, primarily cybersecurity centric. And they were pleased enough that uh, a year ago, we um, implemented a healthcare administration uh, master's degree and recently, this past summer, we executed our second five-year strategic agreement. So uh, it's been very fortuitous for, for both partnerships. And of course, the most important piece has been the, the academic excellence we've been able to provide to the students. Right, I appreciate it. And that's a great example. Uh, Charlie? I, I couldn't agree more with uh, those individuals. So I'll just add a couple of more colors to it. Uh, just real quick, respecting the Mass Global, we work with U.S. universities to expand online programs overseas, and so CSU Global is a partner of ours. I think, you know, in terms of, of the win-win um, in, in the beginning, that's really key. How we um, approach any partnership is the, tip, the first question we ask is, how can we add value to our would-be partner? Because I, I think we, we approach it with that philosophy is that if we can't benefit them, we really can't ask for anything in return. The, the, the economics um, must work because I think a lot of time when potential partners get together, very inspiring, uh, big goals, um, but, but un unless the financials are not viable, that everybody align on the economics is simply not sustainable. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's important. Um, for us, a successful partnership is the one that we had a couple of years old. It's actually a three-way uh, between a Vietnamese university a top, a one to top 10 U.S. IT company and a uh, very high quality U.S. university uh, specialized in the STEM program where the graduate of a Vietnamese bachelor program would then continue on at the graduate level at the U.S. university. Um, being trained, being uh, developed according to specification laid out by the uh, IT sourcing company so that upon graduations of a graduate degree, these students already have a job offer at the IT firm. So to, to me, it's, it's, it's the win-win-win where everybody has a piece of the pie, very clear understanding the beginning, what's in it for them, and then how they can add value to the partnership. That's great, I appreciate it. And hi. Hi everyone. Successful and effective uh, partnership. I think first thing, the two partners should know exactly what do they want, clear vision, clear goals and clear strategies or approaches to reach these goals with a timeline. And most important to focus in the student itself, if it is uh, an educational uh, partnership. An effective example for this is Electronic Saudi University with Colorado. Another example is Harvard with Riyadh Bank. And as uh, the other colleague said, the honesty, the open channels, if anything, wrong and you want to bring it back to the correct target plan, then we can talk and we can bring it and we can correct things to reach our goal. I appreciate it. So um, let, let me kind of flip it a little bit. Uh, we're curious to understand, you know, if you have partnerships that did not work, uh, what lessons did you learn that you can leverage obviously in the future um, to learn and improve? Uh, yes, I was involved in a partnership about 15 years ago that was unsuccessful in an international partnership. 
Um, there was a lack of transparency between the partners. There was a complete lack of trust. Uh, the, uh, the partner was not meeting the minimum uh, academic requirements. Uh, it was money driven and not academically driven. Uh, so that was the incorrect focus to the program. And what I learned from that um, through the good old school of hard knocks was um, it helped me understand the importance of building and maintaining a very, uh, a, a, what it takes to, to maintain a very successful international um, program, which luckily I am now able to interact with uh, and, and understand what the, what the partners needs and, uh, and have complete transparency and trust with the, uh, with the international partners that I currently work with. Uh, Charlie, for me, I think it's um, what I've learned. Some in the beginning, one or more partners um, either were not realistic or not ready. Um, there, there is that strong desire to come together, but unless organizationally there is an endorsement uh, across the board, top down, um, they would not may not be ready to enter into a partnership, or subsequently may not be ready to carry out the terms of the partnership. Um, the other thing um, is, is misaligned incentives. I mean, I think, you know, some of the organizations, some of the partnership we put together in the beginning where the U.S. universities were more interested in enrollment and revenue growth, um, while the, the, the Asian side, for example, were more interested in the brand associations and, um, you know, the handshake of dinner. So while they came together and negotiated in good faith, have great dinner, picture taking, all the wonderful stuff. There's just not a lot to show for it because again, the, the WIFM, I guess, um, was not correctly identified in the beginning. And then the other thing for me is, is really important is that mutual respect was not achieved where one side was perhaps was wanting it more, was pushing it more, um, or was not viewed or not viewing the other side um, on, on, on the same level. And I think that that uh, shows a lot of, of issue that may not come up at the surface, but they're gonna come up at some point which will uh, break the partnership. Higher? Uh, the most important if the base is not ready. I want just to emphasize this because everything else can be corrected, but if any party is not ready or the situation doesn't help, this could end the whole partnership. And now, Carol? Thanks, Charlie uh, and Kurt, for bringing up um, the mutual respect for the partnership, because I've found that in partnerships that have not succeeded that I've been in, um, you know, a lack of mutual respect for the uh, partnership was actually a huge, played a huge role. Um, and then uh, I would go back to, you know, whether the expectations were or in roles and responsibilities had been clearly set. Uh, from the beginning. And then, you know, it is possible for a, a partnership to start out very, very successfully, but then as it grows, perhaps break down. Um, and I think that would require regular checking in uh, and reevaluation of the partnership because uh, organizations grow and they might grow at different levels. Um, and so it's really, really important um, for regular check ins and uh, reevaluations of the partnerships. Um, I have here a list of questions to ask. Is this still working to both of our mutual benefits um, as, as we're growing or the partnership is evolving? Um, are our goals uh, complementing or competing? Um, because that happens as well and can cause to a breakdown of, um, of a partnership. Um, how can the partnership grow or evolve as the organizations are growing and evolving? So um, it may be that a partnership started out um, very successfully, but because the organization has have grown differently, um, if that partnership is not constantly reevaluated, um, then it could later lead to um, a failure to of the partnership. So with that, I'm going to move to the next question. Um, kind of what are the challenges you see in international partnerships in higher education? And obviously the, the landscape of higher education has changed and evolved from a, um, electronics uh, helping us advance. Um, there, there's a host of issues, of challenges for, for coming together in an international space. I mean, I think the language, um, for example, just because both sides speak English um, does not mean that they understand each other. You know, how, for example, how we, when we say certain things or how we communicate certain things can be interpreted very differently, even though we're all speaking English. And so what I found is in, 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 the, in the space where even if what you're hearing, you still have to come back and clarify to make sure that the meaning is being conveyed or the, or the meaning intended to convey is what, how you're understanding it. Um, so it's really important. The, the second thing is cultural. Um, there, there's just a lot of, of difference in how we do business. You know, for example, little things 
like when American folks would go to Asia, they would hand out the business card, they would give it one hand or just, you know, put it on the table where that is a sign of disrespect in some way. And, and, you know, they may not tell you that, but in the back of their head, they're already thinking that way and vice versa. So you really have to understand the cultural norms so that, you know, you're allowed to make mistakes, but it's important for you to understand that. It's not so much to show that you have to, but it's just showing that you respect them enough to learn a little bit about their culture. And then, you know, the, the trust. Um, there, there's a lot of lack of trust in the international space. I mean, a lot of folks look at China, for example, and say, wow, that's a huge market. I need to go in there. I need to form partnership. But the number one thing that everybody, you know, uh, think about is, is how, do we, how do we trust those folks? How do we trust that they will, you know, work with us in good faith and not take our IP and, and vice versa? I mean, there's a lot of issue that you have to, to address in the beginning in some way, shape, or form. Um, the, 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 another component for me is, is lack of operations. Because there's a lot of emphasis being put on forming partnership, and then there's nothing. It just once the agreement signed, everybody parted way, and there's there's no follow up. I was really impressed when we uh, signed the agreement with CSU Global, where at the top Dow, Backy, John, everybody. Not only the agreement process was very pleasant, but there was a very clear plan to execute the partnership. So to me, you know, that's, that's um, another challenge that a lot of organizations need to think about, not just the partnership process, but then the afterward. Uh, last but not least is the regulatory component, um, incredibly complex. Um, just like the US, there's a decentralized process in place for China and many different parts, and you need to understand who has the authority or jurisdictions over the partnership that you're forming. So those are just some of the things I, I can go on and on, but I know that there are other members. No, I appreciate it. Hi, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, the most important challenge was mentioned already, which is language, if you are talking international uh, and the cultures. I think if we are focusing in non-traditional um, educational uh, as of today, and what this is what we are focusing about, we are talking about special audience, which or a special target and student, which is the worker all the time. We need to understand and, and put ourselves in their shoes. Uh, the first time is the time management for them. They need to balance between their work life and their studying. So, uh, if the partnership uh, consider this point they gonna attract much more student and it would be it will be open door for everyone it will not be a challenge do you think that that's consistent across different countries um, when we look at international that is it a similar challenge or do we have to consider that every country may be slightly different of course they are different but at the end who will reach the non-traditional it's usually not the regular student who have a full day to go and attend any college or uh, university. It's that people who don't have this chance and still they want to learn more. They want more experience, more knowledge. So this is, if there is a program or something that balance. I appreciate it. Um, Kale, uh, to you, Kale. But you know, obviously it's, it's still, I think whether it's, um, whether it's online or traditional, um, cost is always a, a barrier to international partnerships. Um, and then infrastructure challenges, uh, um, you know, particularly I was thinking of online education. Um, some, in some countries or some communities, um, they might not have the infrastructure um, to support uh, for example, an on, online, even an, even an online uh, partnership, which, uh, you know, in some ways um, might be easier to facilitate. Um, but uh, so I would just add those to what Charlie said. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Miller, to you. Uh, a couple of other things. Um, I mean, what's been said is absolutely on target and correct. Uh, uh, we need to understand the requirements and the needs of the partner. I mean, that's one of the uh, one of the challenges when you sit down and, and you develop that uh, that initial discussion with the partner and then maintain that con continually and meeting with them and understanding what what there may be some changes and, and having some fluidity to 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 the program. Uh, transitioning course materials that are primarily U.S. centric and be able to write materials that are much more applicable to the to the this, the, the countries and the students that you're teaching and the region. And finally, as, as Haya brought up, 
It is, we need to create materials that are applicable to working adults so they can better their career in the fields that they have chosen. Those are some, some uh, very um, uh, academically focused challenges that, uh, that we need to continually address. Appreciate it, thank you. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. Um, it's about really finding those effective partners um, and determining if they're a good fit. So, um, hi, I'll start with you um, and kind of figuring out uh, where do you start looking for partners and how do you determine if they're gonna be a good partner short-term and long-term? First, I need to define what I need. Then I can look and search to home. And for our experience with the Saudi Electronic University, we have several other opportunity, but it was suitable because of the cost, because of the time. So there is several, uh, several keys was there and uh, was there to consider in my uh, selection. It's about cost. It's about the value that I will get, uh, the big value, the courses and uh, the field will cover among this program. So uh, there is a lot of keys to be covered when you select a partnership and you need to search, you need to, some, to do some effort before you take this decision. Thank you. Carolyn, to you. So hi, yeah, thank you for that because the first I had on my list was to know your own organization's needs, um, gaps, growth opportunities, and what you actually um, need as an organization. So there's a lot of self-evaluation um, that you start with uh, uh, when you're going about finding effective partnerships. Um, and then, uh, you know, research, uh, outreach, um, you know, again, doing the uh, research on those other institutions and uh, organizations to see, again, if their values, their mission, uh, their priorities fit your own. Uh, in addition, um, that you must establish early trust in the relationship. Uh, that's that is a key to ensuring that which that the foundation that you're building a relationship is solid uh, from the beginning all the way through. Uh, you need to meet, or I'd like to say exceed your partner's um, uh, requirements. Um, there needs to be travel by both partners. You can't do this by. Uh, just being online and doing web uh, webinars, you need to be able to meet with them uh, where they are located and they need to come and meet with you where you're located. And it also helps. Uh, we recently had a meeting uh, about uh, six weeks ago where we had uh, several vice deans that came in from Saudi Electronic University and just being able to sit down with them for one day's worth of meeting is worth thousands of emails as far as being able to close that communication gap and ensuring that the partners understand each other's needs and how that they are supporting each other. Um, equal commitment by both partners to include co-equal resource allocation. That is key. One partner can't give it all. It, it needs to be uh, an equal uh, resource allocation and not being asked by a prospective partner to compromise the university's academic rigor, integrities, and standards. We have certain standards that must be met. We cannot compromise those standards. There can be some compromise relative to how the delivery is going to be, uh, but there needs to be a, a, an understanding of what the academic requirements will be. Perfect, appreciate it. And uh, Charlie. Yeah, so that, this is actually um, a part of the strategic advisory service that, that we provide for US universities and I think there's, there's, there's really a, a methodology to this. Um, and I think Haya and, and Carly have also mentioned this too. First and foremost, I mean, I, I think you, you don't know who you're looking for until you know who you are. Uh, you, first, you have to know who you are, what you're capable of, what you need, um, and what value do you, can you offer to potential partners. Uh, and then based on that, um, you, you would um, you know, kind of set out the, the identifying the markets that you want to operate in because international space is so vast. I mean, even China, each tier, each city has its own uh, unique uh, the value, uh, value prop, if you will. And so I think it's, you know, the, the market sizing is really important. And then even within that, you identify who are the partners that would fit the criteria that you're, you're looking for. And then once you kind of have those a few potential partners identified, I mean, I think three really important factors that we always um, emphasize with, with our client is 
you got to conduct your due diligence because um, you know a lot of time when people are coming together, there's a lot of big buildings, shiny objects, there's a lot of big banquet, there's a lot of smiling and full of taking, and you could be overwhelmed. Um, and you know, people don't always tell you the facts the first time. So um, due diligence is, is really critical uh, once you identify the few potential folks that, that you want to work with. Um, and then, you know, based on that, you you all you have all the criteria set and, and you check off the, the list and you approach to, you know, on good faith negotiation. But it's very important that, that you know, got to stay disciplined because the moment the two very anxious individuals or groups coming together, um, there's a lot of different topics. There's a lot of shiny objects and you got to you got to stay true to why you're there, what you want to accomplish and stay focused on those those things. I appreciate it. Um, changing a little bit of direction in terms of the questions. Um, the next question is, to what degree do official government policies help or hinder education partnerships? Um, hi, I'm going to start with you because the next question I'm going to go is actually more of a specific one to uh, Carolyn. By the vision of 2030 and how uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is now moved. Uh, before five or ten years, if anyone talk about such an international partnership, or non-traditional uh, uh, educational, he will think this is very, very impossible things to get. So uh, I think, uh, yes, the policy of the government can help a lot and can support these programs. And you think it could also hinder in terms of yes. yes, yes, because as I said, if we look five or ten years, it wasn't there because the support was there. The vision was not to go to that direction. So I'll, I'll hand that to you. Government policies, if they're, for example, politicized, um, can certainly hinder educational uh, partnerships. Um, they can create institutional barriers. They can, you know, um, cause delays um, that could cause a breakdown in educational partnerships, especially if they're sort of overly burdensome with um, particular regulatory uh, requirements. Um, but um, they certainly can also help, um, you know, because if you have um, governmental policies that support these programs and help uh, push forward um, and, and, you know, support the idea, um, particularly in international partnerships, I think, um, you know, they can certainly help as well. Um, but sometimes I would find that they would probably be overly burdensome in some ways. Uh, Dr. Miller, we'd love to hear from you on this. What I believe is a great uh, government policy, and that is how the Saudi government um, um, ensures the academic requirements are being met through several um, high level academic agencies that are overseas the programs that we have. And it's very much the equivalent to uh, the um, regionally accredited processes that we have in the United States, where each of the program has certain um, uh, program uh, assessment requirements and that these requirements were then reviewed by the by the Saudi government to ensure that they are um, being met and that they're not being uh, degraded in any way and that the uh, and that the students are receiving the education that they were supposed to be receiving. So I see that the government policies that primarily influence the program that I'm involved with are very positive and are appreciated by both the partners at Saudi Electronic University and uh, the faculty that I work with um, as we continue to maintain and, uh, and revise the, the academic uh, uh, courses that we uh, present to ensure that we are meeting those very high level academic requirements that are established by the Saudi government. You know, for example, um, in different markets where the, the China or Vietnam or other Southeast Asian countries where most institutions are owned or by the government at the federal level or the uh, provincial or the city level. And so you really have to understand who has the, 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 the final power, if you will. And because otherwise you can negotiate in good faith with, this, with the university president or who you think is in charge. Um, and then later on that, that the partnership does not fall within the guidelines of the local or of the um, of the government that's overseeing that entity, and basically that would put everything um, a waste of time. Uh, 
because of that, you, you're not going to get the approval. And certainly we, we pay our dues in the beginning because we've been through some of those painful experiences. And so I think first and foremost, before you go into any um, market, you have to understand what are the guardrails? What are the guardrails for that particular market? And even in, in China or Vietnam, um, to say that it's, it's a China's policy, that's not enough. I mean, you really have to understand the provincial who is that institution or that potential partners reporting to, who has the authority. You have to really understand all of those things. And then from there knowing, based on that, what can they do? What can't they do? Because um, it's, otherwise it's gonna put you at, at a severely disadvantaged position to negotiate because you can negotiate your heart out only for them to come back later on and say, you know what, uh, we agree on it, but uh, the city of whatever you know, would own this university is not, um, it's not gonna put a stamp of approval on this unless we do something else. And then basically by then you are already pot invested and um, uh, that, that's, that's, not a good, that's not a good way to go. So um, I think again, the, the point here is that wherever you're going into, can't just say the country, you really gotta understand who are the, the key stakeholders that you're dealing with, what are the guardrails regarding policies and regulatory environment that you really need to understand. All right, I appreciate it. I think that brings up a lot of valid points in comparison to the U.S., which tends to be a little bit more on a federal level, even though you have state jurisdictions, but the federal uh, government a lot of times in the higher education uh, does control the larger policies. Uh, I'm going to go to some specific questions. Um, Carolyn, I'm going to start off with you. Uh, so Sister Cities is focused on international citizen uh, diplomacy. Uh, how can higher education advance your goals? The bigger goal of Sister Cities organizations is to advance um, sort of this concept of citizen to citizen diplomacy. Um, the specific mission of my organization is to advance uh, international trade and cultural and educational exchange, um, which we believe sort of leads to this kind of higher level um, goal of citizen diplomacy and peace building and peacemaking. Um, so, um, and to give you an idea of how educational partnerships can help sister cities organizations, um, I also want to explain that sister cities organizations uh, tend to also be very, very, they generally tend to be quite small. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they have a small number of staff and, and many around the country happen to be all volunteer led organizations. Um, my particular organization is a bit of an exception, but most sister cities organizations are entirely volunteer um, led. Um, so keeping that uh, in mind, these educational partnerships um, can be hugely, hugely beneficial to sister cities organizations. I, I feel that um, sister cities have been around for many, many years about um, kind of where it became an, something here in the United States for probably about 65 years. Um, this concept of sister city partnerships has existed. Um, but uh, so what sister cities organizations do quite well um, is uh, facilitate people to people exchanges. Um, and what they do particularly well is work with youth uh, and facilitate mm -hmm. youth exchange programs. Um, so what higher ed um, has to offer sister cities organizations, uh, particularly online, uh, higher ed online education, now that we're moving towards um, more virtual and online education uh, is innovation. Um, like I said, sister cities organizations tend to be quite small and do pretty incredible things considering how small they are. Um, but a higher an institution of higher education has a lot more resources and um, they're able to innovate more quickly. And so they have um, innovation to offer. They have platforms and tools, uh, particularly, I'm, I was trying to keep this in the um, area of online education, but the platforms and the tools um, to offer, they have students, you know, and we both have that to offer, you know, I think, um, Sister cities are also um, quite effective in um, creating pipelines um, to higher ed and to other educational institutions. Faculty is a huge resource um, uh, as a source of information and knowledge sharing, um, which are greatly beneficial to sister cities organizations, uh, as well as a source of expertise. Um, you know, higher education institutions, because they um, go through an accreditation process and they have, you know, um, many, many uh, layers of what they have to do to become, even become an educational institution. Um, they have a re reputation and credibility to offer. Um, usually their size is much larger um, than what a sister cities organization uh, would be. So um, there's a lot that these higher ed educations uh, partnerships have to offer our sister cities organizations. Um, customization, I, I'm thinking in terms of online, working specifically um, with a partnership with an online institution and sister cities organizations. 
um, they have evaluation tools and um, experience in um, measuring outcomes, um, which as uh, you all may or may not know, um, small, particularly small nonprofit organizations struggle with because it's very expensive to create um, oftentimes um, tools uh, for measurement. So creating these partnerships can be highly, highly beneficial for sister cities organizations. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to move to Charlie, and we're going to kind of keep it uh, move a little quickly uh, and leave for some Q&A. Uh, Charlie, what do you see as the future opportunities for U.S. institutions uh, and overseas institutions to collaborate more? If you don't mind, yeah. uh, just kind of a one, two-minute answer. Yeah, for us, it's definitely around online um, learning because that's what our expertise is. I mean, that's that's an area where I think there's there's opportunity around the world simply because the brick and mortar infrastructure cannot support the growth, um, especially for China and Vietnam are the two markets that we're in where um, 350,000 of them went to the U.S. You know, spending seven billion dollars in tuition in 2016, according to the IIE. 92% um, of them paying cash. So again, this is the most affluent. But what about the middle class from China and Vietnam? Uh, McKinsey in 2016 estimated as close to 500 million middle class in China and Vietnam. These are the folks that do not have access but desire U.S. education. Um, and so what we're doing is, for example, in partnership with CSU Global is we're bringing quality online programs overseas to these markets, to, to the middle class learners, um, and provide them with you know, in-country, on-campus support. So think about that access to quality U.S. education at a very reasonable price, combined with local in, uh, infrastructure to support their learning, is an area that we're the only one operating that right now. Um, and there's a reason for it because, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not as easy to say, let's go to China, let's, let's go to Vietnam, or let's go anywhere else because those markets are not open markets. You really have to understand uh, the regulatory environment, the key players, and how to operate in it in a, in a way. And so, you know, CMS Global is very unique in that aspect. But again, online learning to me is an area that is um, uh, wild, wild west um, for, for most markets around the world. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and I'll leave you the last question for Dr. Miller. How do you see these partnerships uh, benefiting students? Well, um, adding on to what uh, Charlie just discussed, it, it, it allows students to have access to highly respected U.S. Um, um, uh, universities, providing uh, educational opportunities that they probably never would have had. And I think that that being able to uh, give that access to the middle class in, in, in whatever country uh, that, uh, that, that uh, needs this access, I think is important. It allows for students and faculty to exchange ideas and learn on, on a continuous basis. I have never walked out of a Saudi class and not learn so much from my students. So it's that, it's that exchange of, of ideas. And finally, it provides students with a different perspective of what the United States is, that we can be better global students. And the key to that is through education. Perfect, I appreciate it. So um, we have a few minutes and uh, let's open it up to uh, Q&A. Thank you, Eric. I have a couple questions already uh, in the queue or have been reached out to me in other manners. First is, um, what do you see as the future of online higher education partnerships? Where will they evolve from here? I, I think Charlie answered that question quite well in his previous response, um, is that it's accessibility. Um, I think it has the potential for making education, particularly higher education, uh, more accessible to more people. Online is, um, the internet allows for many more people to be able to access um, information that they never had before and, and being able to access uh, through uh, respected local um, universities and then partnering up with, with respected U.S. universities, uh, you know, Haya and, 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 her, and her colleagues and her fellow alum are going to be able to continue to word of mouth start uh, spreading even more information about the value of online education in Saudi Arabia and that's just going to continue to grow and to grow and to grow and I think that's uh, where the future of, of online education is going to be is it's going to be for everyone instead of a select few. Another question received is when one has a successful partnership but then it uh, starts running into difficulties um, how can 
do you have experience for, for how you are able to repair those partnerships or move on from those partnerships? We had a hard stop uh, about three plus, almost three years ago with our program where um, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Becky uh, Takata Tinker had met with the, the high level of Saudi electronic uh, senior management team and came back and we were not meeting the requirements of the program uh, from their perspective. So we went back, we evaluated everything we were doing and then made some very specific changes to the program which has bettered the program and has allowed us to provide a far better educational experience for the student. So I think you have to make that decision on whether you're going to meet those requirements with, with a partner or whether you're going to uh, not move on with that partner. We've talked quite a bit about partnerships, one-on-one -on -one partnerships with other uh, institutions and organizations. Can any of you talk about uh, an example of a partnership that was multifaceted, meaning a larger coalition of partners all coming together? Yes, I have, ex I have an example of uh, such a program. It was with Harvard and Riyadh Bank, and uh, it, it was for three months, and it involved the coaching and uh, uh, sharing the experience itself with the knowledge. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add? Earlier, I mentioned the, the three-way partnership between a U.S. university, an IT outsourcing company in the U.S., and a, a Asian university. But I also like to share another example where in, in China, we put together um, a consortium of 117 Chinese universities. And then we recently added a few more U.S. universities to it, where CSU Global is one of them. It's, it's, um, we very beginning, we identified a few opportunities around the international space that could be improved because right now the credit transferring process between a, a foreign institution to U.S. is very clunky at best. And it's, it's like a big myth where it takes a lot of people involved to explain. We'd like to, we'd like to solve that. Um, and, and the first is, is to identify, you know, the common area that, that the partners will want to work together. So 117 Chinese universities came together with our assistants um, to agree on the credit sharing, the credit recognitions among themselves. Because I think from that perspective, students would then have the ability to transfer even within those 117. And then we started the work now where we are taking some of those courses and we're presenting to our US partners, where we're saying, based on these courses, what programs can you accept? Because I think it's important to, to have that uniform identification. So th there's, there's a lot of work there, but the bottom line for us is there, there has to become an area that a lot of all these people have an interest in. And then we dive in those area and set some parameters around what can we agree on, what can we not, uh, and what's the next steps. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, all panelists today. This was a very interesting and lively discussion. Thank you and see you soon.